The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 38 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the um, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, It's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, But yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. How are we all? Uh, yep, that's all good. Uh, apologies, it's been a while since the last reading, but lots of real life happening. Um, all positive, all positive, but just lots of it, uh, which has meant that, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to give the same time as I would have liked to the readings. Um, It's also made it clear Sundays are uh, increasingly a problem for me to do the readings. So I'm going to try and find another evening uh, on the week where this would be possible. Uh, So I would be interested to hear from you all as to which evening of the week uh, is good for you guys. Um, because uh, the other option for me is okay, technical fuba. Um, the other option is that I do this as a pre-record and then just sort of send the stuff out. Uh, but there's something I particularly enjoy about doing this stuff live. So of course, uh, let me know uh, in the comments what you think about uh, doing these on a different night of the week. Um, Uh, And we'll take it on from there. But uh, before, as always, uh, first of all, a big thank you to all of the patrons on Patreon and on buymeacoffee.com who have signed up to support me. Uh, I really appreciate that. But uh, also a shout out to all of those of you who enjoy what I'm doing, but haven't yet had the chance to sign up and become a patron. Uh, or a supporter, you can do so either at uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, or you can do so on buymeacoffee.com forward slash the bearded wit, depending on which system you would like to use. Uh, don't mind either way, um, but uh, if you uh, are able to. Uh, to sort of support me to the tune of as little as the price of a cup of coffee a month. Uh, The more of you that do that, the more time I can spend doing this and the less gaps there will be between stuff because I've been having to do work to actually pay my bills. 
Um, but if you could support me, that would be fabulous. I would really appreciate that. So patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit uh, and or buymeacoffee.com uh, forward slash the bearded wit. Thank you very much. So how are we all? Um, of course, the obligatory slurp of tea. Uh, for the uh, current uh, European champions, uh, club champions, that is, of course. Hey, Chelsea mug. Oh, I say it every bloody time, but my God, I'm so English sometimes. I do love tea. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing. Oh, hello, Niels. Nice to see you. Hello, Bogana. Hello. Ooh, I've got a new one. And 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 Reda Undale. Undal. Dol. Wow. Great name. Completely mispronounced. I do apologise. Um, welcome, one, welcome all. Mm. I know that I have a struggle today, uh, certainly in Europe, as it's nine o'clock and three minutes ago, Belgium versus Portugal kicked off in what promises to be a very, very exciting European Championship Euro 2020 game. Um, my commiserations to the Dutch, who've just been um, ousted uh, to quite a shock by the Czech Republic congratulations to the Czech Republic on their victory um, and then commiserations to the Czech Republic who will be losing next Saturday to Denmark oh god I might well regret those words I hope they are <laughs> nothing against the Czech Republic but it would be nice to see Denmark go through and I also happen to live in Denmark so there you go anyway quick recap on where we've got to we are in the final book of course um the final book book six of the trilogy he says straight facedly of course that's what they call it um it's the one that's been booked by a uh, pen by uh, owen colfer um who with the uh, full um support of the estate of of douglas adams uh, his style is, is as we found, we're four chapters in. It's very, very good. It's very, very true to the way that Douglas would have written. And it's also keeping to a wish that Douglas had um, prior to his untimely death, and that was that having written Mostly Harmless, which is quite a bleak book and has quite a bleak ending in relation to uh, to much of his other work, although there's always been a, a, a dark edge to his writing. It's, it's very funny, but it's also quite dark sometimes. Um, the book ends up um, really bleakly um, with the entire crew being obliterated um, and, and Douglas himself said as I read in the prologue to this that he wished he'd uh, or he w he did wish to write a last uh, chapter as it were of the whole thing which was less uh, less bleak uh, but unfortunately he was taken from us before he had the opportunity to do that uh, and Owen Culver who had collaborated with Dirk Maggs uh, who had collaborated with in turn with uh, Douglas Adams um, uh, sort of stuck his head above the parapet and penned the book that we are now reading which is and another thing um, where we have got to uh, not far, really. We're basically re-establishing things. Uh, what we have found out is that they're all safe. Uh, they were due to be obliterated by the Grevidon death rays, uh, but Wow Bagger the Infinitely Prolonged um, pitched up in his uh, quest uh, to insult the entire universe alphabetically uh, and uh, just happened to take them away because it turned out that Zaphod Beeblebrox, who also turned up at the same time in the Heart of Gold but was just too busy flexing his his egos uh, to really help too much um uh actually knows people who could quite possibly kill wow bagger the infinitely prolonged and wow bagger has been along for been alive now for so long that that's actually all he wants uh, and so he has got a promise from zephyr beeblebrox that thor will obliterate him um, and that's more or less where we got to so let us crack on Chapter 5 of And Another Thing. Oh, yeah, more tea before we go. Oh, God. Yes, I haven't actually plugged... Um, sorry, before I start, do remember that if you if you pitch into this and you get dragged away from the live readings, of course you can see these. They're, they're saved on the page, the Bearded Whip page. But they're also available on um, podcasts, and you can get those. You can find those on Apple, on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, Deezer, uh, TuneIn, 
basically if you have a, 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 a podcast client on your phone or wherever you listen to podcasts i'll be there on the bearded wit so you can find me there and all of the readings are there as well so anyway chapter five of and another thing anything can be real every Im- oh sorry <laughs> Sorry, before I go on, it is a beautiful summer's evening here in Denmark. The sun is shining and it will be for at least another probably hour and 20 minutes or so. And it's already 10 past nine in the evening. Um, I have the windows open in my apartment where I'm recording this. Um, so there might be the odd bit of background noise. I've, I've got the, at this end of the apartment. I've closed them. But at the far end, which is all one sort of contiguous uh, big apartment, you might hear some noise coming through, especially... If uh, right now the, um, the the sort of 19, 18, 19, 20 year olds at, at uh, Gymnasium, which is the high schools in Denmark, are celebrating their uh, graduation. And one of the traditions is a very hoogly thing. It's a very one of the traditions is driving around on the back of a lorry, drunk as skunks for the day. Uh, and basically people honk horns and wave to them and they have various drinking games and all sorts of d- to do with that so and, and and of course back in the day they did this and all you would hear them was the honking of horns and their screaming but now there are these huge boom boxes and sound boxes that you can get uh, so there's quite often loud noises and singing so so we may get the odd interruption um i don't know maybe maybe they're they're being quiet and sensible now i have no idea so, so if we do get that, we'll tolerate that. And that's an explanation for the people on the podcast version of this. If suddenly you hear loud noises and shrieking and screaming in the background, that is what is happening. And congratulations to all of you. If you are listening, uh, why are you listening? You should be out getting drunk. But if you do have a who, a hat, uh, and you have graduated, congratulations on your, uh, your graduation. Okay. And away we go. So... Anything can be real. Every imaginable thing is happening somewhere along the dimensional axis. These things happen a billion times over with exactly the same outcome, and no one learns anything. Whatever a person can think, imagine, wish for, or believe has already come to pass. Dreams come true all the time, just not for the dreamers. Think of someone crazy, or if that's too taxing, just throw ran- just throw random adjectives and nouns together. Indignant seaweed, no problem. The resentful hijiki of Damagran. The hijiki stands strands asab- um, acerbated by shoals of the triple stripe yellowheads, casually nudging them aside to nibble on the tender coral polyps, banded together and wove themselves into an impenetrable barrier, separating the reef from the fish. The knock-on effect of this was that the reef became sterile and died. The hijiki had tied themselves too tightly to disband, and perished along with the hated yellowheads. How about murderous clowns? No, too easy. Oh, add in a vegetable obsession. Type that into your Hitchhiker's Guide V-board and you will get over a million hits. The top one being the story of Bling and Blong of Circus Minimus, two tiny clowns who both fell in love with Gerda the Amazing Cucumber Lady. After months of feuding, Bling loaded a custard pie with acid and melted his little brother during the matinee. Gerda belonged to him, but so distracted was he by guilt that one evening he accidentally ate his fiancée and choked to death himself on the engagement ring. How about this one? How about an ex-two-headed president of the galaxy who bought a tiny tropical planet from the Magratheans at a knockdown price, then sold it to rich earthlings so that they could live on it in comfort after their planet had been destroyed? How crazy would that be? The Tan Grishnir Arthur lay on his bunk, looking up at the sky to where Fenchurch hovered on a cloud wearing the same dark jeans, high boots and sodden t-shirt that she wore when he had first seen her, passed out on the back of her arsehole brother's car. "'Does the t-shirt have to be wet?' asked the computer. "'What? Oh, God, no! Sorry, of course not. I am such an idiot!' 
just trying to be accurate, I expect. I can portray this Fenchurch person naked, if you'd like. No, 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 said Arthur, in what he thought would like to think was of, of an immediate fashion. A, a dry T-shirt is fine. It was raining that night, so I, I was wet too. If that gets me off the hook at all. No need to explain, said Fenchurch renders head, Fenchurch's rendered head. Guests often take advantage of my realistic representations. I have a celebrity catalogue if you'd like to browse through it. Perhaps some other time, said Arthur. Can you show me these grebulons? Of course. Do you seek closure, Arthur Dent? If you step into the cubicle, I could laser the memories. No, no, I need to see them because of how I feel now. And how is that, would you say? Arthur's smile was as guilty as an orchard thief's. I don't feel too bad, to be honest. Pretty happy, in fact, all things considered. I miss my beach, but, you know, I thought losing Earth would hit me harder. But it hasn't. Maybe if I can actually look into the faces of those responsible, I might feel a little worse. I've got high-definition honeycomb speaker systems, 3D and super-deep perception, wrapped up in a little remote camera no bigger than a human head, said the computer confidently, not to mention point-and-pitch and, and wow-o-wang warbler. Let's see if I can make you feel like shit. What? Your words, not mine. Fenchurch disappeared, and the blackness of space appeared on the ceiling. Arthur recognised the solar system, and the ten planets in elliptical orbit around Sol. The deep blue of Saturn. Jupiter like a giant malachite pebble. Continent-sized boulders spun and shuddered in the asteroid belt beyond Mars. Huge thunderclaps shaking Arthur's bunk as the rocks collided. Was that in the ship or in the show? said Arthur nervously. I put the sound in, admitted Fenchurch. Give me a little poetic license. All these speakers and space is a vacuum. Farther out they flew, whizzing through the blue-black vastness of empty space, wisps of charged interstellar gas crackling across their vista. Past the dwarf planet Pluto they journeyed, to a slightly larger planet, a completely ice-bound body shining smooth but for the pockmarks of palimpsests and the grey industrial pods of an alien spaceship anchored on its surface. The Grebulons, whispered Fenchurch, looking for something else to monitor. The detail was incredible. Arthur could see every plate of armour, every twist of cable. He reached out to touch the hull, and the entire scene lurched and zoomed. "'That's the uh, point and pitch,' said Fenchurch. "'Careful with that. People have been known to throw up.' Arthur peered through a porthole, feeling like a peeping Tom. He saw soft sofas and magazine racks. Amiable-looking humanoids ambled along the carpet hallway, stopping to chat politely or exchange what appeared to be astronomy trading cards. This was not the kind of behaviour a person expects from destroyers of worlds. Arthur looked, but not one of the Grebulons was laughing maniacally, nor did they appear to have misshapen minions. They look so nice said Arthur, a little disconcerted uh, by uh, how easy uh, it would be to be like the, to, to like these people. Fenchurch's snort was so spot on that Arthur wanted to weep. It's always the nice ones. You look up the sub-ether the day after a planet gets blown to smithereens and it's zigabytes of the neighbouring world saying how the rampaging mass murderers were always so polite on trade missions, how they always sent kittens at Catty Bagmus, and how they kept themselves to themselves mostly. Arthur used the P&P &P to zoom in on a Grebulon woman with a clutch of admirers gathered around. Would you like me to put a wet T-shirt on her? said Fenchurch wickedly. Look in their eyes, Fenchurch. The computer sent a dark energy beam through the porthole. 
not the brightest, are they? I can't scan back farther than five orbit cycles with these people. Why would they do it, then? Maybe someone put them up to it. Arthur's stomach lurched as his perspective was shifted at hyperspeed. They withdrew from the surface and passed the inferior planet of Pluto, just in time to catch the rear end of a huge ship, blue rings of light spinning up to enter hyperspace. The ship was yellow and ungainly, and would never feature on a fruity sub ether spaceship show where middle-aged ex-racing drivers threw it around a test track whilst making jolly xenophobic remarks and claiming not to understand all the knobs and dials. This ship was clumsy in the way that comets are not. Vogons, said Arthur, surprised not a jot. Jerks, every one of them, complete assholes. Ah, your people. Arthur managed a spurt of indignance. <laughs> Not my people. That bunch killed all of my people. Well, not all of them. Nearly all of them. Three of us. Three of us. That's all that's left. Soon will be. Soon? What do you mean, soon? Well, I had a little rummage on their computer. Apparently, the Vogons are off to the dark nebula of Sulianis and Ram to hunt down a colony of Earthlings. What? Earthlings? What the hell is a dark nebula? Shouldn't you play ominous music when you say things like that? Can their computer give you any details? On the ceiling screen, the whirring blue circles suddenly froze, turned white, and disappeared, along with the Vogon ship. Too late, said Van Church. Even my instruments cannot hack through hyperspace. Arthur tumbled from his bed, absently jamming the school cap onto his head. We must warn them, surely. Should we warn them? Should we go to this dark nebula place? Bom, bom, bahom. Don't you miss your beach, Arthur? And from Arthur's mind, the computer plucked a memory of his beach hut and plastered it on the ceiling. I miss it terribly. Every day was the same. No exploding planets or people screaming at me or aliens invading my personal space. Why do people always feel necessary to stand nose to nose for simple conversation? <sighs> well, plus, on my beach, I could stray as far as I wanted off the subject, and nobody tried to drag me back on course. So, why would you follow the Vogons? They never fail. Why give yourself the heartache? <sighs> and I, I need to go because a large part of me doesn't want to go. I mean, what kind of earthing would I be if I didn't want to save my species? Well, an alive one, not blown to atoms by Vogon thermonuclear warheads. A little archaic, but they do do the job. We have to turn around, or power up a drive, push the go-faster button, or something. Calm yourself, Arthur Dent. Wow Bagger goes where his schedule takes him. He was going to Earth, wasn't he? To insult Earthlings. True. Well, then, the last Earthling e uh, colony appears somehow to be in this dark nebula. Couldn't Wowbagger uh, insult the Earthlings there? It's feasible. You state your case well, Arthur Dent. Guide Note Throughout recorded history, the ability to state one's case well has generally had about as much success as talking things out reasonably or putting aside our differences.
The people who use these tactics generally mean well and could make excellent motivational speakers or kindergarten teachers, but on no account should they be put in charge of situations where actual lives are at stake. Malaprop ma comments such as, uh, I know we haven't always seen eye to eye, tend to send negotiations spiralling towards disaster especially if the other species' representative suffers from the globular organ envy or thinks you are being a patronising git. Successful negotiations are invariably conducted from a position of power, or at least the perception of power. Strolling into a meeting wearing a comfortable robe and smelling of incense with a sincere desire to iron out difficulties is, perversely, a surefire way to get everyone killed. General Anya Tsita, the acknowledged prince of negotiators, once claimed that while on the job he never used a sentence that did not include at least one zark, two shits, and half a dozen arse-cracks. His final pronouncement contained only a single shit, and was uttered in the form of an authoritative command to his bowels, which had locked up as a result of too many hours seated around the negotiation tables. Unfortunately, because of their very thin bowel walls, Golgofrinchens are prone to catastrophic bowel ruptures, so General Anya Tsitsa's final utterance was also what killed him. "'You're absolutely right,' said Arthur. "'I do state my case well. I ought to state it to Wowbagger immediately.' "'Perhaps not so articulately,' suggested Fenchurch's image." May I propose a zark and perhaps a couple of palm wranglers? Slurp of tea. Wow Bagger sat in his favourite vibro chair on the bridge, trying not to talk about himself. Outside the corona of the ship's force field, the destruction of the Earth had pulverised the moon, resulting in an elliptical dust ring that was heading for Venus. Look, Trillian Astra, another planet is about to die. Ask me about that or something else. I have seen many wonders. Trillian was not in the mood to be distracted. An in-depth profile of Wowbagger would have sub-ether editors drooling into their non-fat, low-cal, lacto-laxo sim coffees. The people want to know about you. Who is this green alien who travels the universe insulting everyone in alphabetical order? Ah, you see, that's not the way I do it any more. The whole alphabetical order thing was amusing for a while, but then I became a slave to it. People were expecting my insults and began returning the favour. Random looked up for a page on which he was drawing a series of savage-looking flayboos, saying, what, saying stuff like, you're a pathetic loser? To paraphrase, yes. Or, I didn't know lizards wore suits. Once or twice, I'm trying to talk to your mother. Or, is that smell considered pleasant where you come from? Trillian wrapped her daughter into an embrace that looked suspiciously like a headlock. I'm not leaving you, darling, never again, so there is no need for all this hostility. I wish you would leave, said Random, scowling. Without you around, I turned out pretty bloody well. Trillian disguised gritted teeth as a loving smile and turned back to her interview. So, you have abandoned your alphabetical trademark. Yes, said Wowbagger. I do planets now. It's much simpler and I don't need to listen to every insult slinger in town trying to take me on. I simply pull into orbit and drop a data bomb into the atmosphere. Everyone gets an email and a sound file. Believe me, if you press that play button, then you are left in no doubt as to how I feel about sentient beings. And how do you feel about them? They're mortal. I despise them. So, underneath all this aloofness is a simple maledic ma maledicent. What? You... You think I enjoy using foul language? Don't you? Well, yes, 
immensely. But it's not just that. And then Wowbagger told Trillian something that he had never told anyone. Perhaps it was the almost hypnotic tone of her slightly husky voice. Perhaps it was time to tell someone. I want them to kill me. I want them to try. Oh, God, thought Trillian. Record a chip. Don't fail me now. She glanced down at her wristwatch and was relieved to see the audio readout flickering. That's quite a statement. I... I... I, I, I suppose it is, said the green space traveller. Guide note, this was Wowbagger's first stutter since visiting the caster system where the swear word Gugugruntivards increases in potency with each added G. I am amazed to hear myself saying that. As am I, Mr. Wowbagger. I think it's time you call me Bowerick. Bowerick? My first name. My first... My father had a sense of humour. Bow Wow Bagger? Oh, yes, said Trillian, suddenly caring a little less about her recorder. The universe cannot suffer tender moments like this to last for very long, and there were contenders for the honour of trampling roughshod over this one. The first was Random Dent, who was taking a moment to compose a disgusted disparagement before she stalked from the bridge for the second time. But the winner was her father, Arthur Dent, whose comedic arrival nicely counterbalanced the saccharine nature of the moment, thus restoring order to the universe. "'Right, you Zarkers!' said Arthur, rushing onto the bridge. "'We need to turn this turd bucket around "'and get our palm-wrangling palm tails "'to the dark nebula of Sulianis and Ram. "'Bom, bom, bom!' trumpeted the computer, just trying to help. "'And then, for one final cosmic laugh... "'Oh, uh, was that a bit harsh? Sorry, everyone. "'What's a palm-wrangler, anyway?' Morty. How are we doing on time? Yeah, let's crack on a bit. Chapter 6. The Planet Nano. Far out in the fringes of the Dark Nebula of... Su Dark Nebula? Dark Nebula? Let's try that again. Far out in the fringes of the Dark Nebula of Sulianis and Ram, there is a small planetoid that hangs on one of the nebula's curling tendrils like a Christmas tree decoration. This dwarf planet, catalogue number MBP-100101, ignores the universal law of gravitation to maintain a spinning permission, uh, spinning permission, spinning position, 150 million kilometres from the surface of Ram. At these particular coordinates, the nebula's clouds of interstellar dust, hydrogen and plasma have been parted by gas streams and magnetic fields to reveal an oasis of clear space devoid of debris and bathed in a nourishing solar wind. The tiny planet, Nano, succeeds in defying the pull of its star chiefly because of its huge mass, composed mainly of super-dense matter excreted from white holes but also because of the revolving dynamic core powering over 5,000 servo-mechanical thrusters. This discrete positioning ensures consistently temperate weather conditions and encourages life to flourish on its first fertile uh, vastitas, azure oceans, and abundant number of fjords. An abundance that is unusual on a planet which has never known an ice age. Nano's geography is a cartographer's dream, a single Pangeatic continent spread across the equator, surrounded by unpolluted seas which are brimming with fish literally waiting to be caught. Guide note. In this case, the word literally is not simply a misrepresentation of the word figuratively. The Amegalian am am major steelback fish are reared with a st stories of paradise at the other end of the line and hang around fjords just waiting to be saved. The inaccuracies of these stories would be obvious to most the moment they were dragged from their natural habitat by a hook and tossed whole into a sizzling pan. 
but such is the faith of the steelbacks that they simply flap their way through the twelve psalms of deliverance and wait for their promised golden ball of plankton to appear. The registered name of this continent is Innisfree, after the lake isle in Sligo Island on the recently vaporised planet Earth, where the movie The Quiet Man was set. The larger of two towns on the continent is called Kong, after the village where The Quiet Man was actually shot. These names have been selected by Nano's registration officer, a certain Mr Hillman Hunter. Hillman Hunter is not a particularly religious man, but he does have faith in the traditional order of things, when the traditional order is stacked in favour of the entrepreneur. Hillman Hunter believes in money, and it is very difficult to make money in times of anarchy. How is a fellow to put a few bob together when the little men do not respect their betters and there's no big man to tell everyone how to behave? Men need some god or other to show them their place in the world, and ideally that place would be far below Hillman Hunter's. Guide Note The notion that religions can be useful tools for keeping the rich rich and the poor abject has been around since shortly after the dawn of time, when a recently evolved bipedal froggart managed to convince all the other froggarts in the marsh that their fates were governed by the almighty Lilypad, who would only agree to watch over their pond and keep it safe from Gurnapike if an offering of flies and small reptiles were heaped upon it every second Friday. This worked for almost two years, until one of the reptile offerings proved to be slightly less than dead, and proceeded to eat the gluttonized bipedal froggart followed by the almighty lily pad. The froggart community celebrated their freedom from the yoke of religion with an all-right all-night rave party and hallucinogenic dock leaves. Unfortunately, they celebrated a little too loudly, and were massacred by a gurner pike who for some reason hadn't noticed this little pond before. Hillman Hunter has come to believe that this new world should have, should have a god to issue commandments, smite sinners, and declare which forms of conjugality are pleasing in his eyes and which forms are just wrong and gross. Because Nano has been undeniably made by the planet-building Magratheans, and not god, it does not have a deity to rule over it, which is causing some debate in the community. The natural order is falling apart, and all sorts of people are beginning to consider themselves equal to those who obviously are equal, which is not what religion is about at all. Hillman has decided that a presiding god is needed to restore the pecking order, so on this particular Thursday, in a small conference room beside the town's municipal building, he was holding interviews for the position. Town of Kong, Innisfree, Nano a huge anthropoid was seated uncomfortably in the inf int interview room's office chair, its grotesque scaled torso squirming in the confines of the small seat. Tentacles dripped from its chin like fleeing slugs, and hard, back eye hard black eyes glittered from the depths of a pulpy face. Hillman Hunter shuffled the pages of the creature's resume. So, Mr. Cthulhu... Is it? Hmm, said the creature. Ah, oh, good, said Hillman. A bit of the ineffable. I like that in a deity. He winked conspiratorially. Still, it wouldn't be much of an in-depth interview if you couldn't get a few facts out of you, eh, Mr Cthulhu? Cthulhu shrugged and dreamed of days of wanton genocide. Anyway, let's get this show on the road continued Hillman brightly, or, as my nano used to say, let's get the streamers on the shovel, which was a reference to the cleaning of cow doings off the driveway after the herd had been driven through. Uh, that's how I started, Mr Cthulhu, selling dried cow biscuits for people to burn on their fires. And look at me now, be Jesus, I'm running a planet. Hillman laughed suddenly with a noise like a rusty machine being fired. Oh, sorry, Mr. Cthulhu. I smoked like a train back in the old country, and I haven't had a minute to check in for new lungs. Being in charge of this crowd of bloody Egypts is running me ragged. He danced his fingers down the pages of Cthulhu's resume. Let me see, what do we have here? What calibre of a deity am I dealing with? Ah, I see here you were in people's minds a lot a century ago, thanks to Lovecraft. Not much since then, eh? 
Cthulhu spoke in a voice of meat and metal. Well, you know, science and all that. Put a bit of a kibosh on the god business. Clear gel dripped from his tentacles as he spoke. I kicked around Asia Minor for a while, trying to drum up a little fear. But people have penicillin now. Even poor people have reading material. What do they want gods for? Hillman nodded along with Cthulhu all the way. You are so right, sir, so right. People think they are too good for gods, too smart, but not here on Nano. We are the last outpost of Earth, and we will not be destroyed because we have driven away our protector. By the time he'd finished this little speech, Hillman's chubby cheeks glowed round and proud red. Next question. Our last god was less is more kind of guy. Sent his son down, but didn't show up too often himself, I think. I had no disrespect for the man himself, but that was probably a mistake. I honestly believe that he would have put his hand up he would put his hand up to that himself now if we could ask him. What I'm asking you, Mr. Cthulhu, is are you going to be on a hands on God or an absentee landlord? I'm getting more and more Irish in this stuff, because of course it should have been from the start, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cthulhu was ready for that one. He had been practicing this answer for this very question with Hastur the Unspeakable only the previous night. Oh hands on, absolutely he said, leaning forward to make clear eye contact, as Hastor had advised. The days of blind faith are over. People need to know who is blighting their crops or demanding virgin sacrifice. And now I am going to look away, but only because prolonged eye contact will drive you insane. Hillman shook the sudden torpor from his head. Oh, good, good, quite a stare you have there, Mr. Cthulhu. Handy weapon to have in the arsenal. Cthulhu accepted the compliment with a flap of one prodigious tentacle. Ah, OK, now let's move on, shall we? Where do you stand on the whole Babelfish argument, proof denies faith and so forth? My subjects will have proof, 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 proof. And faith, rasped Cthulhu. I will bind them to slavery and trample the weak underfoot. Ah, I seem to have hit a little nerve there, chuckled Hillman. Again, I think you're on the right track. Maybe you might want to pull back a little bit on the slavery and the trampling. We have quite a lot of weak people here, but they are big supporters of the church. Whatever church we eventually pledge to. Money builds temples, or, as my nano used to say, many mickles make a muckle. Mickles? said Cthulhu, confused. And it's not easy to confuse a great old one. Hillman scratched his chin. I, I, I never knew what a muckle was, or a mickle for that matter, but it takes many of them to make many of one of the other. I've, I, you see what I mean? Hmm, said Cthulhu. So, an old standard next. So, sorry, <laughs> that was Hillman. So, an old standard next. Presuming your application is successful, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Cthulhu brightened. Thank you, Hastur, he beamed into space. In five years I will have raised this planet, eaten its young, and stacked your skulls high in my honour. He sat back, satisfied, succinct and informative, a textbook answer. A spluttering cough blurted from Hillman's lips. <coughs> Skull stacking? Come on, Miss Cthulhu, really? Do you think that's what gods do today? These are interstellar times we've got here. Space travel, time travel. What do we need on Nano? What what we need on Nano is, is what I like to call an Old Testament god. Strict, sure, vengeful, fantastic, but indiscriminate eating of young? Those days are gone. Shows what you know muttered Cthulhu, crossing his legs. Hillman tapped the resume. I have something highlighted here. Under current status it reads, Dead but Dreaming. 
Could you elaborate on that? Are, are you indeed dead, sir? It could be said that I'm dead, admitted the oozing anthropoid. You don't seem dead. Ah, yes, but this tiny form is not me. Cthulhu poked his body as if he were not familiar with its workings. This is my dream of me, made substantial by dark and terrible forces. I wear this form until my true self is called back to service. My true self is quite a bit bigger. Uh, uh, sorry to harp on about this, but are you dead? For the moment, yes. I would have to say yes. But gods cannot die. That's the whole point. Cthulhu wished Hastur could be with him. Hastur was always quick with the comebacks. Well, that's true. Uh, but I suppose... Technically, and I stress, technically, I am not actually a god. I am a great old one, a demigod, you might say. Hillman closed the file. Oh, he said, I see. It's more or less the same thing, persisted Cthulhu. I do all the same things, apparitions, impregnating, you name it. I have cards for the lounges in Asgard and Olympus. Gold cards. Uh, yeah, these things are all well and good, but don't bother, said Cthulhu disgustedly, gel splattering the desk. You people are all the same. Never give the little guy a chance. Uh, it's not that, sir. I have nothing against your kind, but the advertisement did specifically say Grade A God. I'm sure you can do lots of things, but we're looking for someone with a bit of substance. Someone who's in it for the long haul. Certainly not someone who can die. Cthulhu rose from his chair in a furious rage. I will crack open your skull, he thundered. I will visit pestilence on your land. But he was not needed, and was already fading. I will tear your head from your torso and drink you. And then he was gone, leaving nothing behind but the smell of a harbour at low tide. Drink my what? wondered Hillman Hunter, scribbling the words no callback in highlighter on the cover of Cthulhu's resume. Blood, probably, unless it was my cerebrospinal fluid. Hmm. He leaned back in his chair and turned on the back massager. Hillman was a positive kind of guy, always willing to look on the bright side. But this hunt for a god was getting depressing. Not one of the interviewees had met any of his standards. Excello, the robot god. Vladirsky, the vampire god. Hecate had a few good skills, but she was female. Goddess of Nano? Not bloody likely. And as if the god hunt wasn't trouble enough, he had to deal with all the strife from the other colony. Killing people over cheese. Did you ever hear anything more ludicrous? A bit of cheddar was lovely on some crusty bread, but hardly worth dying for. <coughs> there was the problem of the staff who were deserting the town in droves. Some days Hillman Hunter felt like just staying in bed. "'All you need is a nice cup of tea and a few biscuits,' Hillman said in a squeaky impersonation of his grandmother, a voice he often used to motivate himself. "'Then you'll be grand!' Even the thought of tea made him feel better. I know how that feels. What was an Irishman without tea? Twice as angry as an Englishman without tea. "'Get up off your backside, Hilliers,' he said in Nano's tones. "'These people need you!' It was true, the colonies, colonists did need him, especially after the cad, cadnapping? kidnapping of Jean-Claude. 
What Nano needed was a real live god to thunderbolt a bit of discipline into its residents. But how do you attract a grade A god to the unfashionable fringe of the western spiral arm of the dark nebula of Sulianis and Ram? It would take one hell of a benefits package, that was for certain. Hillman took a note of Cthulhu's sub-ether address, just in case. Guide note. <coughs> The gods came into existence a few millionths of a second after the Big Bang, which basically means that they did not create the universe, rather the universe created them. This is a sore subject in the halls of the holy, and is totally off-limits around a dinner table. If a journalist has the temerity to broach the topic, he could find himself punished in a strange and imaginative way. Most of the gods have been alive for so long that they have assembled entire libraries devoted to the topic of strange and unusual punishments. As recently as 10,000 years ago, there were seminars on Olympus devoted to the subject. These seminars were discontinued as an increasing number of the minor deities were treating the gathering as an excuse to drink and fornicate, which resulted in a glut of new hybrid godlings who had actually absolutely no mythology to go home to. While the seminar ran, it handed out a yearly award in the shape of a spiked pufferfish in honour of Loki's famous stroke of turning a sex addict into a pufferfish who would poison anything he tried to embrace. Among the more memorable puffies awarded was the one given to Heimdall, who, in a fit of pique, turned a gang of builders who were overcharging him into the wall uh, that they <laughs> into the wall that he they had refused to complete. I like that. Another one went to Dionysus for his punishment of Sir Smoog Nautil, the Blagulon cap and actor, who performed the one man show playing to the gods, which was slightly critical of its subject matter. Dionysus, whose area was theatre, was a liberal fellow, and would have let the play run had it not been for a scene where he himself was depicted as a flatulent binging fool. So enraged was Dionysus by the scene that the positive notes it garnered uh, sorry, so enraged by Dionysus by the scene and the positive notes it garnered that he condemned now tall to an eternity of being the rear end in a pantomime donkey suit, where the bum cheeks before him were at the hands were the heads of his two fiercest critics, forever reciting their most scathing reviews. Classic. Gods had a great time of it for millions of years, swanning across the sky in their chariots, showing up in different places at the same time, being all wise and stuff. But then science developed to the point where it could duplicate many of their tricks. Blighting a crop was no longer a big deal as it used to be. There were virgin births all the time. In fact, many societies preferred virgin births as they cut out the need for in-laws, and parents didn't have to imagine their children doing anything nasty with strangers. The last straw for Godkind came when Fenrir, the giant son of Loki, tried to impress his dwindling flock by driving his space cycle into a white hole. The only part of Fenrir intact after the jump was one of his molars, which is a now glowing asteroid orbiting Sagar 7, and can do nothing but influence the tides and communicate vague messages to clairvoyance. The gods were horrified and all except Odin, uh, as it was foretold that Fenrir would devour him at the same time of, uh, as Ragnarok, so he had a little giggle into his fist. And they retreated to their homeworlds, vowing never more to consort with mortals. The actual sentence was, Mortals, screw em, which does not read as godly as a sentence containing the words vowing never more and consort. So serious were the Aesir about this vow that they surrounded their world, Asgard, with a, she a shell of ice, leaving only one point of access, Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, which was guarded by the all-seeing god Heimdall. Visitors were not encouraged. In fact, visitors were actively discouraged from attempting to dock by ravenous flesh-eating dragons, soul-sucking siren succube, and fluting, a scurrilous Norse technique of insulting a person which focused on genitalia and parentage. The gods wanted nothing to do with mortals, especially investigative journalists, more especially holy people looking for some kind of heavenly reward. But the most unwelcome person in Asgard was Galactic President Zephod Beeblebrox, and each of the dragons had been given one of his old shirts to sniff. The Heart of Gold uh, 
Uh, no, you know what? You know what? I'm going to stop it there. I'm going to stop it there, gang, uh, before we get too far into it. And it's also quite a good spot to leave it, as we now know that if Zyphod Babelbrox goes to Asgard, his goose is, as they say, well and truly cooked. So, of course, that's probably where he's going to go. We'll find out in the next reading. Thank you very much for joining me again this evening, everybody. Um, usual uh, request, please, if you can, uh, go to patreon.com forward slash thebeardedwit or buymeacoffee.com forward slash thebeardedwit and become a patron or supporter. You can do that from as little as the price of a cup of coffee a month. Uh, the more of you that do that, the more I can do of this. Uh, thank you so much for joining me again uh, i will see you all soon <laughs> i'll say that what i will probably do if you are following me on the facebook group uh, i will put up a poll uh, i think to see what week what day of the week is better as i say i'm finding uh, sundays a little bit tricky and i would like my sundays back if that's possible uh, just so i can get a load of other stuff done at the same time i'd rather not do these as pre-records so let's see if we can find another night of the week that suits people um uh, to do it but uh, let's uh, let's see where we go um, thank you so much, Morgana, for, for listening. Uh, that's a very kind comment. And um, see you soon. Look after yourselves. Be hoopy, be fruity. And whatever you say, given that it is the most outrageously rude word in the galaxy, never say the word Belgium. <laughs> see you guys. Bye. <laughs>